welcome our beloved, the one and only, freshly rested, <laughs> full of vim and vigor, the one and only, the Reverend Dr. John Scott. <laughs> I like that. Coming events cast their shadow. Good morning, beautiful friends and family. First of all, let me say thanks for all the calls and texts and emails and prayers and above all the love they, they conveyed during my recent health challenge. I am, yes, freshly rested back on both my feet. Thanks to Drs. Freddie and Dr. Sonia who put body and soul back together very skillfully. Thank you all for just being here and keeping the Temple of Light, light burning. Uh, I'd like to also welcome those who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. At this, isn't this just a lovely time of year? The light changes, the, the weather promises the cool of Christmas. It's just wonderful. We're really entering a sacred season of celebration during which people of differing religions honor the coming forth of the light for all humankind, within our hearts and within the lives of humankind all across the planet. Some people observe the winter solstice as the return of the sun in the darkest time of the year. Others light the menorah in honor of Hanukkah, and of course those of the Christian faith retell the tender story of Christmas and of the star that appeared at the birth of the Holy Child, leading wise men to the discovery of the Christ. In the USA and elsewhere in the diaspora, people of African descent celebrate Kwanzaa, which begins on December 26 and runs till January 1st. Kwanzaa, as a matter of interest, was created by Maulana Karenga to honor the African heritage in African American culture. And it was first celebrated in the USA in 1966-67. It has seven very interesting core principles, or Nguzo Saba, as it is known. And I wanted just to share them with you briefly. The first principle, Umoja, meaning unity. To strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. Kuji Chagulia, which stands for self-determination to define ourselves, to name ourselves, and to create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. Ujima, meaning collective work and responsibility. To build and maintain our community and help solve each other's challenges. Since, as we say, no man is an island. Ujama, cooperative economics to build and maintain our own businesses and to profit from them together. Naya, or Nia, I'm not certain which is the, pro the proper pronunciation, I think Nia, purpose. To make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness. Doesn't that sound like science of mind? Koumba, creativity to do always as much as we can, in the way we can, in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it. And finally, Imani, meaning faith. To believe with all our hearts in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our places in life. The celebration of Kwanzaa includes the lighting of seven candles representing these seven beautiful principles. And you know what I notice when I look at all the various traditions and rituals and rites of all the cultures? They all involve recognition of the light. The light that lighteth every man, woman, and child coming into the world. And so whatever the observance of this special time of year, by different cultures and different faiths. The coming of the light represents inspiration, illumination, truth, enlightenment, and the dawning of new hope for all humankind. The coming of the light is truly 
good news. So I've titled today's encouragement, as I have started to call my messages, Good News, Good News. There's a lovely, delightful carol with the same title, set to music by our own maestro, Noel Dexter. And whenever I hear them play, I hear it played or sung, it reminds me of a little ragged boy who used to sell papers at the corner of King and Harbor Streets when I worked in downtown Kingston in the early 70s. And I often think of him waving the star and saying, good news, good news. Some shepherds saw an angel in Bethlehem while they was washing them socks. I got spanked one Christmas because I, my father taught me while shepherds washed their so socks at night, all seated round the tub. An angel of the Lord came down and they began to scrub. And I, my mother was sitting in the choir stall and heard Dennis, my brother, myself singing it. And I got a thorough spanking when I got home, but it was daddy cause it. So I can see this little boy calling out the good news. And, you know, he was barefooted and his eyes shone like acacids. He, his eyes were like the paper that he was selling. They shone like stars in his head. And he always had this big, big smile. He said, Stag! Stag! Get your stag! I'm sure he grew up to be a fine Jamaican citizen. And one of my life's regrets is that I never got to know his name. Now you might wonder why the name of a little star boy remains important to me so many years after our paths crossed. But he taught me a very powerful lesson one Christmas time. And I'd just like to share that story with you. You see, I was walking with a co-worker whose divorce was the subject of a scurrilous article in that afternoon's publication. Like most news publications, this star was not known to be a herald of good news. Anyway, as we came up to the little boy, instead of brandishing the front page which carried my co-worker's photograph, he tried to conceal the paper from us. My colleague said, it's okay, pal, I know it has a story about me. To which this little boy said, yes, ma'am. And if it wasn't that I needed the money to help look after my sick mother, I wouldn't even sell the star today. Because you is my friend and you always buy from me. There's this silence, because how do you respond to that from a, maybe a nine or a 10 year old? Is that a lesson in loyalty? Or is that a lesson in loyalty? My co-worker thanked him for his thoughtfulness and bought the paper so that she could use it as fuel in the bitter battle which she was preparing to wage against whomever crossed her path. But friends, Christmas makes miracles in human hearts. And love, as Khalil Gibran says, and I quote, if it finds you worthy, directs your course. End of quote. We weren't back at office five minutes when my co-worker said, John, come with me. I'm going to drive back down on Harbor Street. I said, we just got back. What is the matter with you? And now we're going by car. She said, just come. And my, me, like a loyal friend, said, OK, and got in the car with her. And back we went to the corner of Harbor Street. And as she pulled up alongside this little boy, she said to him, how much star you have? I don't remember how many he had left. But he hadn't been selling for very long, and so he had a pile of them on the street, on the road beside him. She said to him, put all of them in the trunk. And she paid him for the whole darn lot and said, go on home and look after your mother. Isn't that amazing? Friends, if there ever was a Kodak moment, that was one. You should have seen that picnic's face. Furthermore, you should have seen my face. I started being a baller early in life. But better than that, you know, she said to me as we were driving off, I had vowed to bring a lawsuit against all of these people, but this kid has taught me a lesson in decency that I will never forget. So you see, friends, we can find the Christ in the most unexpected places and in the most unexpected people. And therefore, we need to be acutely aware with whomever we're interacting that we are in the presence of the divine. 
Historically, the good news of Christmas proclaimed by Christian preachers can be found in John chapter 3, verse 16, and I quote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, unquote. The passage is quoted as proof positive that Jesus had some special dispensation as the Son of God, which was reserved only for him. However, Meister Eckhart, one of the great mystics of the Middle Ages, gives new meaning to this statement, interpreting it to mean, and listen to this, that God never begot but one Son, but rather the Eternal is forever begetting the only begotten. The eternal is forever begetting the only begotten. So the term only begotten refers to spiritual man and woman, the principle of divinity in all human beings, which is the Christ principle. The only begotten means that which is begotten only of God. I want you just to remember that today. The only begotten means that which is begotten only of God. And so you see in each of us, there is that which is begotten of all kinds of, of so-called heredity. One person may be begotten of an addicted parent and thus appear to repeat those traits. Another may be begotten of ancestors who have a history of a certain disease. So they may mistakenly accept this as their lot in life. And you know, many of us, without realizing it, are begotten of the strong, almost subliminal suggestions in advertisements that seek to shape our tastes and motivations in ways that bring those advertising greater profit. But my friends, the good news in John 3.16 is that God's love is so great, his wisdom so infinite, that he has given unto you and me that which is pure and perfect, that which is begotten only of God. No matter what a person may experience, he or she is a son or daughter of God. And each of us has within us the infinite potential of the Christ. If you can believe this about yourself, and I mean really believe it, you can be not only the inlet, but also the powerful outlet of all there is in God. This is your greatness. This is the good news of your own incarnation as a son or daughter of Almighty God. Let us affirm together, I am begotten only of God. No, ain't that good news? I am begotten only of God. Now ain't that good news? The beautiful Jesus discovered the divinity within himself, which was begotten only of God. This is the Christ. Christ is not a person. It was not Jesus' last name. It is not Jesus the man. Christ is the degree of sonship with God that Jesus attained and demonstrated, and it is the degree of potential sonship or daughtership that dwells in every human being. This is what St. Paul meant when he said in Colossians 1 verse 27, Christ in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus bid us to follow his example by taking that Christ way that he discovered to fulfillment so that we too may live in the knowledge that life is everlasting and life is eternal. I know that we understand this intellectually, don't we? But I also know that if you have lost a loved one during this past year or so, particularly if this is your first Christmas without them, you may experience periods of deep sadness, dark moments that not all the lights on the Christmas tree can brighten. As a friend of mine said to me, you know, John, I know my loved one has moved on to something greater, but the knowledge of her eternality doesn't ease the pain when I'm wrapping presents or preparing the Christmas meal. That's very human, isn't it? And it is to be expected. And so I have two assignments. You thought you were getting away? In spite of the fact that you have to be here for the concert this evening, you have assignments to do.
two for you this morning. The first is for everyone. And the second assignment is for those for whom the joy of Christmas may be tinged with a little sadness at the absence of a loved one who is no longer on this plane of activity or is no longer in our experience. So your first assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is a simple one. Learn the names of the people who serve you. The guy in the restaurant who you have ordered a meal from, ask him his name and use it for the time that he's serving you and the time that you're there. The postman, the garbage truck driver or foreman, the security guard at your office complex, the person who sweeps your stretch of street, the newspaper vendor from whom you regularly buy, the cashier and packer at your supermarket, and the person who you have been seeing at church for the longest while and still call them, why am named there? Oh, what's your name again? Um, the one sharp bridge. She's tall and slim. Joke you. Today, as you browse and shop at our Bring and Buy Bazaar, make a point of asking a stranger their name and sharing yours. And this evening at our concert, introduce yourself to the person sitting near you if you don't already know them. For you know, friends, calling somebody by their name indicates that you recognize their value. So learn people's names and give them the gift of recognition this Christmas. The second assignment can be undertaken by all of us because most of us have had to say goodbye to loved ones, either because they have made their transition or because the relationship has ended. This exercise will be especially useful for those whose grief is still fairly recent. It's a simple exercise, but it really is very healing. Here's what you do. When the sadness or loneliness grips you, take a moment to practice heart breathing. To do heart breathing, simply imagine a warm breeze entering your heart each time you inhale. And then remember your loved one or loved ones in the dearest form you can conjure in your mind as you sit with them in a beautiful, safe, and comfortable room. Recognize that the love you shared is still alive and it transcends time and space. Love once expressed can never be recalled. It ripples out into the universe forever and ever and ever expanding. And if, you're, if your ways digress, if one of you moves on, that love still is eternal and ongoing, and it blesses everyone whom it touches. So silently say the person's name, and then say, your love is a treasured gift. Thank you. Can we all think of somebody who has moved on and just say that together now? Together. Your love is a treasured gift. Thank you. My friends, like Jesus, we too can discover the divinity in all people and make the ideal of the Christ a reality in our everyday lives. Let us remember this Christmas that there are no chance meetings on this plane. Everyone we encounter is there for a reason. Some for a long and love-filled happy time as friends or family, and some for what feels just like a brief moment, a nanosecond in eternity like my little boy selling newspapers, or someone sitting beside you at our concert this evening. All are our, in our experience by divine appointment, and all are important aspects of our life's journey. All, all are divine. One of the things that has really touched me, and I think it has also touched Reverend Michael in our correctional ministry, is the recognition of the participation in the program that we just finished. To hear those men expressing that they know that they're valid, valuable, and authentic creations of God, and that they are indeed here to share the knowledge of their divinity and to spread that knowledge with everybody whom they meet. I will share with you at another time a poem written by one of them which just will just knock you off your seat, but I won't share it this morning. I think it'll be for our New Year's workshop commercial.
Please turn to your neighbor and say, thank you for being a divine part of my experience today. Namaste. Thank, thank you for being a divine part of my experience today. Namaste. Thank you for being a divine part of my experience today. Namaste. My prayer for you, my friends, this Christmas is the deep knowing that the Christ indwelling is the law of your lives. Let us affirm that. The Christ indwelling me is the law of my life. The Christ indwelling me is the law of my life. Friends, by this law, by this divine principle, you are the purveyor of the good news that we can accomplish great things for ourselves, for our families, for our church, and for our nation, as together we work to make this a nation and a world that indeed works for everyone. May the good news of your Christhood illumine every minute of this festive season. You are the Christ in Christmas. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.